especially one thing that's very important to understand is that the startup phase of an organization is very stressful there's no startup in the world that ever makes it especially when you've got a big bold ambitious goal like we do you will never get there if you're working nine to five you have to work evenings you have to work weekends blood sweat and tears that's how you build an amazing startup So the first quarter of the year is quickly coming to a close and it all seems like January and February had more or less 90 days. Uh, so we hope you have your pen and paper out today because there are, about to, there are about to be some very important gems that are going to be dropped here today. So our guest today is the founder of the African Leadership Group, African Leadership Network and African Leadership University and Africa's Advisory Group. Collectively, this institution aims to transform Africa by identifying, developing, and connecting three million game-changing leaders in, for Africa by 2060. He's won multiple accolades, including being recognized as Times 100 Most Influential People in 2019. AOU was also recognized by Fast Company as the most innovative company in Africa and 39th in the world. Our guest today is Mr. Fred Swanica. Maybe he can tell us something that he hasn't posted on the internet or the internet hasn't told us about him because we do read a lot about you. So maybe you can, we can break the ice like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, something that's not online about me is the fact that I'm a huge lover of pets and um, I have a dog. His name is Iggy. Iggy. Yeah, and uh, he's one of the... The joys of my life, going home to a dog, you see, because a dog has unconditional love. No matter how bad a mood you are in when you left the house, when you come back, the dog always loves you. <laughs> so, I like pets. My dog's name is Iggy. <clears throat> Welcome. So, this is the ALU podcast, Entrepreneurial Leadership in Africa. I'm your host, Savannah Olo. And we're just going to dive right in into the topics that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be um, highlighting more of what it's like to build powerful networks and also being a talent magnet. So to start us off is, if you can recall, could you please describe your first networking experience and lessons learned from it? Um, so I don't really believe in networking. Um, I think networking uh, is um, something that connotates a short-term, one-soft transactional thing. Um, and uh, for as long as I can remember, I've always been good at gathering people and creating communities and in building relationships. Right? And uh, so, you know, when I was in primary school, uh, at the age of nine or ten, my house in the afternoon was where everyone gathered. Like all my friends after school, we'd gather in my house. We, that's when we, you know, we'd play games, we'd, we'd uh, just have fun, and um, and then you know I, I I formed clubs and societies when I was in primary school, and and recruited other people to join me in them, and I've always enjoyed and uh, hosting parties and hosting events. Uh, in college, my room was was called La Casa, <laughs> which stands for the house in Spanish. I had, a, I had a, a roommate from Bolivia and we used to throw parties and salsa parties and things like that. So I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, no, getting to know people, connecting them to each other, connecting them to opportunities. And I've just in, I've found that, you know, one of the things I really believe is that life is not about how much money you have or how much fame or power you have, but really about who you spend it with. And so I've always really enjoyed surrounding myself with people that I just enjoy being with. And so one of the things that I say to people who want to have powerful networks and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, you know, relationships is that uh, relationships are built one person at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, I talk about the four steps to relationship building. The first stage is when you meet someone and there's just some sort of a connection, right? You have something common, you enjoy talking to the person, there's something that says, oh, this is an interesting person. And so 
maybe you exchange business cards or you give the person your phone number, your email or whatever. Most things don't go beyond that, right? The second phase is when you now have what I, what I sort of call a repeated interaction, right? So you now catch up with the person for coffee, you exchange a few messages or WhatsApp, a few emails, you continue to interact with that person, right? Mm -hmm. From that continued interaction, you get to know them better, you get to see if there's more alignment of interests and values. And then after that phase, you then move into uh, trust. Now the person knows you. They see that you're someone who delivers what you say you're going to do. You trust each other's values. You see what you're aligned on in terms of your interests. And then only when there's trust, you have the fourth stage, which is collaboration. That's when you now actually maybe get to do something together. And maybe that person invests in your business or they join your organization as a partner or they introduce you to a customer or whatever you might actually need them for. So 90% of the people that I meet in life, I, I never actually leverage them for anything. You know, and, and I, go, I don't go around trying to collect people so that they can be useful to me in some way. I go around building relationships for relationship's sake because life is much more rich that way. It's much more enjoyable. Right. And sometimes, yes, that does help me when I need to you know, build m my business or I need access to, s to capital or I need something else that can help me as an entrepreneur. But people can see through when you're, being, when you're just trying to use them to get access to something. Right? They need to see that you truly believe in who they are and you care about them as human beings and that you're building the relationship just for relationship's sake. And so the bottom line is, if you want to have a powerful network, don't network. <laughs> you don't hear that every day. <laughs> um, so you launched African Leadership Network, an association of over 2,000 of the most prominent leaders in Africa. You had earlier built a network of over 5,000 high schools in 48 countries. And how were you able to build this network? As I mentioned, one relationship at a time, you know, <clears throat> uh, I travel around Africa, visited different schools, you know, leveraged people in the organization. We, we hired uh, people who would cover different regions um, and they would go on to visit schools and visit uh, refugee camps and youth groups and talk to the media and started to create relationships and get awareness about what we're doing. Um, you know, we... Uh, you know, I personally grew up and lived in different countries in Africa, right? So I was born in Ghana at the age of four. I moved to Gambia, and then I moved to Botswana, and then I went to Zimbabwe. So I personally knew people in different markets. When I was working for McKinsey, I worked in Nigeria. I worked in Tanzania. I worked in Ghana. So these are all relationships that, over the years, we had been building, either personally or through our organization. And then, of course, we hired a team of relationship managers that went and built relationships with heads of schools, we sent out communications and we literally just put our, you know, put out the word that this is what we're doing. Because one of the things I believe as well is if you live your life with intention, the world conspires to, um, to give you what you, what you, what you, what you, uh, you know, you hope for. And so we shared a lot of our vision, what we're doing. And then, you know, it infected others and then others took the vision to where they were going. And so people started, you know, approaching us to say they want to be part of it. They want to, they want to work with us. They want to, apply they want to partner with us in different ways so you know this is really how we have over the years built our networks and our relationships you know if i walk into a party i'm not the kind of person who's like you know high-fiving everyone and going from one place to another i'm, I'm a bit of an introvert mm -hmm. um you know i'll talk to one person only and um and i'm happy to talk to that one person the whole evening or maybe maximum two or three people but i'm not talking to you and then I'm looking around the room to see who's more interesting that I should go and talk to. Because <laughs> right? again, people can see through that, you know, are you really engaging with them or are you just trying to, you know, use them for a transaction? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell one story around how, how, you know, important this is or just sort of how, you know, you'd be surprised that how if you take a genuine interest in people, you will um, often be surprised at how that actually leads you to much better outcomes. So I was at, uh, attending a a lunch in San Francisco in Silicon Valley. And um, one of the most prominent leaders in Silicon Valley walked into the room. And this woman is a billionaire. She's, you know, very, very powerful, influential. 
that everyone in the organization went to go and talk to her. Um, and, you know, I just didn't go there. And I, and I looked around and there was a woman sitting at a table by herself and I needed to sit down because the event was going to start. And I just you know, asked her whether I could sit next to her. And she said, oh, sure, fine. So I sat next to her. She was dressed very plainly. Um, and, you know, we started a conversation and uh, I got to learn a bit more about who she was and she learned a bit more who I was. It turns out that she was running the foundation for one of the founders of Google. And, you know, she had access to $34 billion of wealth and no one in the room knew who she was. <laughs> everyone had to talk to the person, talk to everyone. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and here I was sitting next to her and, and I was able to talk to her and, you know, we, we struck up a relationship. And so, again, um, you know, uh, my advice is if you want to build relationships, you sh we should be aiming to build relationships, not to build a network. Okay. And the relationships is what ultimately uh, makes life more enjoyable, makes life worth more, li more living, worth, more worth living. And sometimes, every now and then, you can leverage those relationships to also help you as an entrepreneur. But you need to, it, that happens indirectly, not directly. All right. Uh, so we've talked about um, building relationships, not networks. That's essentially what, what the main do is to building a network. Um, what would you say are the don'ts? Maybe you can give us three examples. Well, the don'ts, I said, I know, don't think of it as a transaction, right. right? So don't think, you know, and so sometimes when we organize events like the African Leadership Network, people would come and say, oh, you know, I paid an attendance fee and I left and I didn't have a deal. And I said, you're missing the point. <laughs> what you're doing is you're investing in relationships right. and you need to keep coming back and getting deeper and deeper and really understanding that, you know, those multiple interactions will then lead to trust and then the trust will lead to collaboration. It takes time, right? So don't, don't rush it. And, uh, and, and, um, and really, so one don't is definitely don't, don't, don't look at it as a transaction. Number two is you need to really um, think of a relationship as a give and a get. So one thing that people find is that they are always looking to extract value from relationships and they're asking for things all the time. I need this, I need this, I need that. People get tired of you. They don't want to only be, you know, to be some, they don't want to be feel like ATM machines and you're coming to just extract things from them all the time. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So you need to think about what value are you adding to the other person's life. And if you can't find something valuable to, to give someone, you should, you should really not be asking for something from them. Right? Yeah. And you'll be surprised at how much value you can give to someone, no, even someone who's much more prominent or wealthy than you are. Maybe you can introduce them to someone else in your network. Maybe you can give them some you know, knowledge that they didn't have. Maybe you can you know, uh, help their child with something. Maybe you can babysit for them, whatever. <laughs> There's something that you can do that adds value to their life, right? Yeah. And so you need to really think about giving before you get and investing in relationships and, and really you know, showing that you are someone that adds value to their lives aside from that. And if you can't, you know, just it's okay. There's, there's actually more than enough people in the world that, can maybe, that you can build relationships with and who might be able to help you at some stage. But don't be going in and just trying to... Uh, because one of the things people need to realize is that the world owes you nothing. You know, so I, sometimes I've met people who have, you know, billions of dollars who should have been supporting our work, and they just weren't interested, right? Um, so they don't... So I'd say a third don't is ne or never avoid thanking someone, even if they don't give you something that you asked for, right? So I've been so many interactions with people who I met with, they maybe had resources, they had ideas or things that could have been helpful, but they didn't offer. Right. Or even sometimes when I rarely ask, they said no. I still send them a thank you and I'm still grateful. Or sometimes people have made promises or pledges. Oh, I'll, I'll do this. I'll support you with this funding. And then maybe they change their mind and they give me half of what they had promised. Still be grateful. You can never ever go to someone that has given you something and tell them that that wasn't enough or that they, they promised this and they delivered that. No. And I see that often in young people today when they say, well, oh, you know, you were supposed to give me this, you were supposed to give me that. The world owes you nothing. And, you know, people have so many competing responsibilities. They have limited resources. 
And so you know, one one don't is never be ungrateful. Always be grateful for no matter what support you get from anyone, yes. even if it's less than what you hope they they they, they would have given you, because it, that creates good karma. It develops. You know, you build a good relationship with them, and then maybe later on they might do something more, or they'll introduce you to other people in their networks because they they, they realize that you're someone who, you know, is um is grateful and 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 who, um, is really appreciative of whatever help that you that 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 that, they, that you do get. So, those are just some things that I would say are, you know people should not do as they build relationships. Um, so your organization has had some of the most um, sought after and highly accomplished employees. How do you get them to join your mission? Well, aside from doing the small things like babysitting for our friends <laughs> and building relationships with them. So how were you able to convince people to sort of join your mission? Well, one of the things that, um, you know, as a founder of an organization, uh, if you want to get attract great talent, firstly, you know, you need to do it yourself. Right. So I spend about 50% of my time hiring people. I don't outsource it to, uh, you know, anyone else. Um, in, when I start an organization, I personally hire the first 150 to 200 myself okay. right, so that they fully understand the vision, they understand the values of what we're creating. And once you build that first cohort of 100 to 150 people and you ensure that they all meet your standards and, and more importantly understand the vision and values, then they can then start to attract others because A-class players attract other A-class players. B-class players will bring in C or D-class players. So you need to really make sure you bring in the, you know, the top talent yeah. yourself and then they can help you attract others. The second thing is, um, one of the things I really believe is that if you want something to get really big, you need to give it away, right? So um, that means sharing responsibilities. If it's a for-profit company, it means sharing ownership giving employees a stake in the business, other your, your co-founders, uh, giving people titles. Be generous with titles. Titles are free. <laughs> so if someone wants to be called X, Y, and Z, and, and, it'll, look, and, and if it'll make them happy or it will be, you know, they think it'll be great on their CV for the next role, give it to them. Yeah. What, does it, what does it cost you, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm very happy for, you know, a young person to call themselves, <clears throat> you know, uh, director of X, Y, and Z, even if they only have two people in, that they manage, it's fine, <laughs> right? So you can, that's another way to, you know, give people um, incentives to, to, to want to be part of your mission. But more importantly, what you need to give away is responsibility. Give them a chance so that take it away from you and give it to others. Give them a chance to really own something. Give them a chance to drive a part of the business, uh, to, to co-create with you. They don't just want to be, you know, told what to do. They want to be partners. Right, so you know, I really give people a chance to get significant responsibility. Very often, uh, you know, several years before they would get in another organization. Right. right. So then they say, "Oh wow, if I join this team, I can grow very quickly." Right. Um, and then finally, you have to, um, you know, make sure that uh, you're working on an exciting mission. Right. right? Um, and. Uh, the more exciting your mission is, the, 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 more attract, the more attractive you will be to top talent because people want to be some part of something great and something that's changing the world and that's going to um, you know, really have an impact. You'll be surprised that, you know, because people work for much more than money. You know, they really want meaning in their lives. And so if you have uh, something that is transformative for society and that is really um, going to... Um, give people that meaning, then you'll get a lot of, you'll be able to attract a lot of great talent to join your mission. All right, that actually is a perfect segue into the next <laughs> part of my questions. <coughs> um, so we often see great talent come and go, and we've had them from your network. For a good example is probably like the Minister of Trade um, in Botswana, who was at the former CEO of Phoenix International. So what would you, what would your advice be to the people or the entrepreneurs being able to attract great talent but struggle to retain it? Well, you see, I, I really believe in uh, a world of abundance, not a world, not a world of scarcity. Right. So, um, you know, you obviously need to do your best to retain talent and create a great environment for, for people, great work experience, give people challenging assignments, you know, um, pay them as much as you can, of course, within reason. 
um, and uh, you know, do all you can to to make sure that if there's a great fit between you and and someone who's working in your organization, that they stay for as long as possible. But you know, when the time comes where perhaps the aspiration that the person has is not what you can give them at that time, maybe they want to be paid more than you can afford to pay them, yeah. or they want to be promoted to a certain role and they're not ready yet, or you know, or for various reasons you can't meet the aspirations, then you know, I don't have any hard feelings that that person decides to leave. You know, because very often I find that people come, they work with us for a few years, they go and they do something else, and then they come back. You know, or um, if you're really good and you, at attracting more talent, then if someone leaves, then another great person will come along, yeah. right? Um, and then what you then have as well are ambassadors out there in the world who can carry your mission and can carry your brand and, and, and can really, you know, so I really believe in building long-term relationships even with those who leave our organization. They're still part of our family. Um, and so, and also, turnover is very healthy for an organization because um, it creates an opportunity for fresh new ideas to come in, fresh energy, because people get tired after a while of working in one organization. Mm -hmm. Especially, one thing that's very important to understand is that the startup phase of an organization is very stressful. There is no startup in the world that ever makes it, especially when you've got a big, bold, ambitious goal like we do. Yeah. No one will be able, you will never get there if you're working nine to five. You have to work evenings, you have to work weekends, blood, sweat, and tears. That's how you build an amazing startup. So if you expect that you're going to come in, if people expect they're going to come in and have a nice, cushy job, that, then that startup is not going to be successful because you just don't have the resources, you don't have the time. You know, every day you need to make progress, whether you've got cash or not, because cash is burning. So the kinds of people who can thrive in that environment are very different from the kind of people who will thrive when the organization is five, ten years old and things have settled and it's much more calm and so forth. So in those early years, you should expect burnout. People will come in, they work very hard for two to three years, and then they must, they probably must move on because they can, they can only maintain that pace for a, a limited period of time, right? And so it's not a bad thing, you know, when when people. Um, especially in the early days of a startup, you should expect a lot of turnover. Also because you as an organization, you know, one thing, the only thing, you know, I've, I've built about eight different organizations over the last 20 years. And if you look at all the startup literature, you talk to other founders, they will tell you that the only thing that is guaranteed when you start a company is that your plan will not work according to plan. That's the only thing that is guaranteed. Right? The only constant is change. So you're going to have... A plan, you think, oh, I need a team that's going to do X, Y, and Z because this is how the company is going to work. Then you start and you realize that, oh, this assumption was wrong. The customers don't like this thing that you thought they would like. This thing costs you more than you thought, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to need to change. And those who make it as successful entrepreneurs are not necessarily those who have the best ideas, but they are those who are able to adapt and constantly course correct. You know, they hit one obstacle, they don't give up. They, tr they try another pathway. And you keep going and you, and you adapt and you change and so forth. And so that means you need very flexible people, yeah. right? Because I hire you, I said, you're going to do marketing. But after two months, I realized, actually, I need you to do finance. Then after three months, actually, I need you to do, uh, you know, customer service. And then, oh, oh actually, I need you to, to you know, uh, do um, tech development, whatever. I need you, to, you're constantly changing your roles, yeah. right? Yeah. And so some people just can't survive in that environment, right? And only after a while would you actually figure out your business model and you start to get, you know, um, momentum and, and traction. And then you say, oh, okay, I can now settle and have more specific defined roles. I can actually have job descriptions. I mean, in a startup, when someone comes in and asks me for a job description, I say, what do you mean? Your job description is whatever it takes <laughs> to get this thing off the ground, <laughs> right? And so... There are some people who just can't deal with such uncertainty and such lack of structure. Right. And so those people typically will, will join a startup and they'll leave it immediately. They'll have an allergic, allergic reaction to it. And that's okay. 
right? Because those people typically don't belong in, a, in an organization here. So these are all the the different ways that I look at, um, you know, talent. I think it has to be a fit for both sides. One of the things I always say to, to talent is that, you know, people who, who join an organization is, um, if you go to an organization every day and it's painful for you and you don't, you know, hop and skip to work in the morning, um, why do you stay in that organization? You know, I really, life shouldn't be stressful. You know, if, if, if you're not enjoying working in that organization, then, you know, make a plan and go somewhere else. Because there's, um, you know, there's, if you are not enjoying it, then you're not going to be, you know, developing yourself um, as best as you should. And, you know, you should obviously make suggestions and ask for and maybe what might make your experience better. But if, it's, if you are finding that you're going for months or years and going to work is not giving you energy, then you really should be looking to go somewhere else because, you know, you might be finding that maybe there's another place that's a great place for you, right? And so I think it's, it, you know, it must work for both sides, um, both the, the organization, both for you as a founder and the person who's, who's in your organization. Um, and, and when you find that magical fit, then it's a great partnership and it lasts for, for a long time. Okay, so you've, you've sort of sent out your mission and the world knows about it. You've attracted talent. How is it that you're able to keep a conducive environment to sort of um, have them keep up with a high-paced um, environment and the high pressure that comes with being a part of a startup or just being an entrepreneurial space like this? I think ultimately the thing that keeps people going through um, the ups and downs of a startup is having a very, very clear mission. Right? That doesn't change. And so that through all the constant flux, everyone knows at least the end goal. You know? So we've been very, very clear. Our mission is the transformation of Africa yeah. by developing 3 million leaders by 2035. That has not changed over the last 15 years. Right? We, keep, we have one goal. Where, where the problem we're trying to solve has not changed over the last 15 years. We've been trying to address the challenge of leadership in Africa. The solutions we've been using have been different, right? So one of the things they say is that entrepreneurs are often very stubborn on their on the problem they're trying to solve, but flexible on the solution they're using, right? And I, I I'm very much that that way. <laughs> Would you say the end justifies the means? No, absolutely not. The end does not justify the means. Yeah. Um, you need to obviously approach things in an ethical way and in, you know with integrity and you know and make sure that you don't do it anything at all costs. But um, one of the things that allows people to, it gives them some stability in the midst of constant change is that mission. And having a very clear mission that doesn't change um, and that is inspiring and motivating and gives people the energy to go through all the ups and downs. Another thing is, is, is making sure that you, know, you have an environment where your colleagues are truly exceptional, right? So having others that you can work with you know, in those late hours, those evenings, those weekends, it makes it so much more fun when you're working with really cool people, yeah. right? Yeah. And you're and you're and you're and you're, you're bonding with great people. You're building really great relationships. So you need to make sure you, b you build great teams. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, having uh, you know outlets for people's stress. Whether it's you know every now and then you take people out for a fun excursion, or you know, there's a dance party in, uh, at 10 p.m. at night whenever we're working late. You know, these are the kinds of things that just let steam out, right? But yeah. you've got to think about, you know, how do you create an, an environment where people really work hard, but also play hard. Um, and, 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 and that's ultimately what, what keeps people going through. But like I said, not everyone is made up for a startup.